Hello Set Apart Saints, this is David, and in this video series we've covered the context of the Olivet Discourse, how it's directly related to the prophecies in Daniel 9 and Daniel 12, how it's part of Messiah's declaration in Matthew 23 that judgment would come upon the unbelieving Jewish leaders in that generation. And we've covered the verse-by-verse -verse explanation of Matthew 24 verses 1 through 14, which leads up to the major sign of the abomination of desolation in verse 15, which marks that judgment draws nigh. In this lesson, I'm going to add more information to the fulfillment story, as it helps us see what took place in the first century. First, I want to focus on the Jewish leader's decision to set Barabbas free when they delivered Messiah up to be killed. In Mark 15, it says, and there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with them, who had committed murder in the insurrection. But the chief priests moved the people, that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them, and they delivered Jesus when he had scourged them to be crucified. On the surface, Barabbas seems to be just another robber and murderer, who was due to be crucified for his crimes, and probably he would have been the third person that was killed with the other two, who I'll talk about in a moment. So Messiah was killed between two men, and Barabbas probably would have been the third one, but the Jews chose Barabbas over Messiah. So to understand who he is, let's look at people groups in Jerusalem to see their perspectives about being under Roman oppression. The Pharisees were conservatives who believed that the Father's kingdom would come only when the Jews perfectly obeyed the law of Moses. Though they didn't like the Roman suppression, they strived for purity and waited for the Father to send a Messiah who would reward them by overthrowing the Roman suppression. The Sadducees represented the wealthy class who sought to live a good life. They worked with the Romans to maintain their power in high places. And we'll see this played out as the Jewish leaders delivered Messiah up to be killed to protect their nation from being desolated by the Romans. The Zealots believed that the Father's kingdom would only come when their Roman oppression was ended, which caused them to be revolutionaries who killed both Jews who stood in their way and the Roman oppressors. They believed that they must take the kingdom by force, and the Messiah would be the one who would return the Father's glory unto their nation. The Zealots have the example of Antiochus Epiphanes, who brought his Grecian army and surrounded Jerusalem in the 2nd century BC. He killed thousands of Jews and he desecrated the temple. And the Jewish Maccabees carried out guerrilla warfare to overthrow the Grecian army, recapture the temple and city, and have self-rule again. And we'll see this played out as the Zealots made war with the mighty Roman army during the Jewish-Roman War of 66 to 70 AD, which led to the desolation of Jerusalem, the temple, and the Jewish nation. The Sicarii were a splinter group of the Jewish zealots. In Latin, the word Sicca is a long dagger. They were mercenaries who killed both Jewish and Roman leaders who stood in the way of their agenda. Jewish historian Josephus documented that they would hide their daggers under their ropes and attend the Jerusalem feast days when it was filled with worshipers. They would blend into the crowd, target their victim, carry out the assassination, and then blend back into the crowd and disappear. Some of Messiah's disciples were zealots. Simon the Zealot was one of Messiah's disciples who may have hoped that he would cause a revolution against the Roman oppressors. Some scholars think that Judas Iscariot may have been a zealot as well, who may have abandoned Messiah when he spoke of dying instead of taking the kingdom by force. Maybe Judas thought that if he got Messiah arrested, that he would force his hand to rise against the suppressors who would carry out his crucifixion. And Barabbas was a Jewish zealot. So now that you understand who the zealots are, and that they believed in robbing and murdering to seek to take the kingdom by force, you see where Barabbas fits into the story. The zealots were willing to use violence to oppose their Roman oppressor, perhaps to hasten the Messiah's coming, as they looked to Messiah to be their liberator from Rome. Barabbas was a zealot robber and murderer who was scheduled to be crucified by the Romans. He was a revolutionary who stood up for his people against the oppressive Roman Empire, which believed in pagan gods and were an abomination to the Jews. But there's more to the story. 
Many scholars believe that early manuscripts point to his name being as Jesus, Jesus Barabbas. The Jesus, Jesus in the Greek, part of his name may have been omitted from the Greek manuscripts out of reverence for Messiah. So in effect, Pilate's question to the Jews would have read, Whom do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas? Or Jesus who is called the Messiah? The word Bar means son, and Abba means father. So the name Barabbas quite literally means the son of the father. Are you seeing it now? Pilate was effectively asking, who do you want me to release for you? Jesus, the son of the zealot father or Jesus, the son of the heavenly father. You could be sure that the name's meaning is not a coincidence as it has the father's fingerprint all over it. The legal decision that was made by the Jews impacted not only the Jewish nation, but the whole world. So the Jews chose a revolutionary zealot over Messiah. So now let's focus on the scene of the Jews being given a choice between Barabbas the zealot and Messiah, the peacemaker who taught the Jews to love the father and their neighbor. The Pharisees and the zealots were looking for their Messiah to overthrow the Roman oppressors and exalt them to power. The Sadducees had a good working relationship with the Romans who allowed them to live a great lifestyle. Before them stood a man who proclaimed to be the anointed one, the Christ, but he showed no signs of seeking to overthrow the Romans. And instead, he positioned himself against the Jewish leaders. He taught his followers to be peaceful when being oppressed and love your enemy, even the Romans. This was not the Messiah that the Pharisees and the Zealots wanted. On the other hand, Barabbas was a freedom fighter who wanted the Jews' kingdom to be freed so badly that he was willing to kill people who stood in the way and even die for this cause. Both Barabbas and Messiah were charged with treason against Rome, of which the penalty is death. The Jewish leaders chose Barabbas, a notable leader of the Zealots, who gave them a charismatic warrior, a messianic figure, to fight against Rome. They rejected their king and feigned allegiance to Caesar. John 19.15 says, But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then the Jews foretold their fate to Pilate. Matthew twenty seven twenty five says, Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. The rich irony is that during the Jewish Roman War of 66 to 70 AD, it was the zealots who shed the blood of the high priest and the wealthy citizens, and they caused the war with the Romans, who slew hundreds of thousands of Jews by the sword, spilling their blood all over Jerusalem. Messiah's blood was poured out for the Jews' sins when they delivered him up to be killed, and it was the zealots of Barabbas who poured out the Jews' blood. Are you seeing the rich fulfillment of prophecy in the amazing way that the Father exacts his vengeance against wicked people? The Zealots played a major role in the time of Great Tribulation which came upon the Jewish nation. Even before the Jewish-Roman War of 66-70 to AD, the Zealots persecuted and killed their opponents in Galilee, Samaria, Judea, and Idumea. But when the Roman army came through those areas, the Zealots were driven into Jerusalem, where they played out their role of instigating the judgment of the Jewish nation. You'll see in future lessons in this series that it's the zealots who caused the peaceable Jews to be killed, who killed Jews who sought to surrender to Rome, who warred against the Roman Empire, which brought harsh judgment upon the whole Jewish nation. So we go back to Daniel 9, which says, The people, the Jews, of the prince, Messiah, that came, so Messiah carried out his ministry, he came in the 73th week of Daniel, so it's saying, The people of the Jews shall destroy the city and sanctuary. Many people say it's the Romans who destroyed the city and the sanctuary, and of course that's true, they were used to do it, but it's the Jews who caused it to happen, and that's what Daniel's proclaiming. Daniel's saying that these people, the Jews, who delivered their promised Messiah up to be killed, caused the desolation of the city and the sanctuary. And the Jews who were most to blame for the city and sanctuary being destroyed by the Romans are Jewish zealots. And there's a distinct irony about Jewish zealots bringing about the desolation of Jerusalem, the temple, and the Jewish nation, as they chose Barabbas the zealot over Messiah. 
The Jewish high priest declared that it is better for one man, Messiah, to die than for the Jewish nation to perish at the Romans' hands. John 11:48 to 51 says, If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for that nation. When Messiah was delivered up by the Jewish leaders to be crucified, Pilate gave them a choice between Jesus and Jesus Barabbas. One, an innocent man. One, a thief and a murderer. Barabbas was set free, and likely he gathered together his group of zealots. When Messiah warned his disciples to flee Judea, he wasn't just saving them from the Romans' hands, but from the wicked ways of the zealots. The zealots were pushing for a war against the Roman oppressors, and Messiah knew the calamity that that would bring. So do you see the rich irony? The Jewish leaders chose a murderous zealot over Messiah, and then the zealots caused the Jewish nation to be desolated within that generation. Scripture doesn't say how old Barabbas was, but if he was a young man, he could have been around to see his attempted revolution against the Roman Empire take place from 66 to 70 AD. Was he captured and crucified outside of Jerusalem like Messiah? That would be amazingly ironic as he would see the desolation of Jerusalem, the temple, and his dream of taking the kingdom by force fall short, and he would have been justly crucified for his sins. I want to make one final point. The two men who were crucified next to Messiah were thieves. But more than that, they were probably part of the insurrection against Rome, probably with Barabbas, as the punishment for being a thief is not crucifixion. It seems that they were Jewish zealots who sought to overthrow the Roman oppression over the nation. And again, Barabbas probably would have been the third person that was crucified that day. But the Jews set him free and delivered Messiah up to be killed. So of the two thieves, one believed in Messiah and was saved. The other mocked Messiah and was left lost in his sins. And that summarizes the division in Jerusalem. As some of the Jews believed in Messiah and they were saved spiritually and from the coming desolation of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But the other Jews rejected Messiah and were left dead in their sins and the Jewish nation was desolated within a generation. Shortly after Barabbas the zealot was released, Messiah was led to be crucified, and women were weeping for him, to which he said to them to weep for themselves and their children, for he knew that the zealots would come and cause a time of great tribulation for them. Peter proclaimed to the Jews, The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, have glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God had raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Paul proclaimed that the Jews persecuted Messiah's saints. First Thessalonians 2, 14-16 says, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always. For the wrath is to come upon them to the uttermost. Paul's pointing to the wrath which is coming on the Jewish nation. He wrote 1 Thessalonians before 70 AD. So he's pointing to the judgment. He's pointing to their crime, and he's pointing to their judgment, and that they caused Jerusalem and the temple and the Jewish nation to be desolated. In a previous video, I referred to signs which took place before the desolation of Jerusalem, the temple, and the Jewish nation during the Jewish-Roman War of 66 to 70 AD. But I want to go through them again to add some more information, which sets the context. The wicked Jews asked for signs from Messiah to validate his authority, and the sign that he gave was his resurrection after three days. But signs did appear, which foretold Messiah coming in power and glory to use the Roman army to desolate the Jewish nation. 
coming in power and glory, which we'll see in a future video, means coming in judgment. So Messiah is coming in judgment against the Jews who rejected him by using the Roman army to desolate their nation. The following account was recorded by Eusebius, a historian who lived in Caesarea from 263 to 339 AD. Thus were the miserable people won over at this time by the impostors and false prophets. So he's pointing to the Jews being misled. But they did not heave nor give credit to the visions or signs that foretold the approaching desolation. On the contrary, as if struck by lightning, and as if possessing neither eyes nor understanding, they slighted the proclamations of God. He says that at one time a star, in form like a sword, stood over the city, in a comet which lasted for a whole year, and again before the revolt, and before the disturbances that led to the war, when the people were gathered for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, on the eighth of the month, at the ninth hour of the night, so great a light shone about the altar and the temple that it seemed to be bright day, and this continued for half an hour. This seemed to the unskilled a good sign, but was interpreted by the sacred scribes as portending those events which very soon took place. Halley's Comet appeared in 66 AD, and the long tail looked like a sword in the sky, but its duration, lasting a year, was without precedent. Another sign is at the same feast, a cow being led by the high priest to be sacrificed, brought forth, gave birth to a lamb in the midst of the temple. But the circumstances of the prodigy are remarkable. It did not occur in an obscure part of the city, but in the temple, not in an ordinary time, but at the Passover, the season of our Lord's crucifixion in the presence, not of vulgar merely, but of the high priest and their attendants, and when they were leading the sacrifice to the altar. Another sign is that the eastern gate of the inner temple, which was of bronze and very massive, and which at evening was closed with difficulty by twenty men, and rested upon iron-bound beams, and had bars sunk deep in the ground, was seen at the sixth hour of the night to open of itself. Another sign is that not many days after the feast, on the twenty-first of the month, a certain marvelous vision was seen which passes belief. The prodigy might seem fabulous were it not related by those who saw it, and were not the calamities which followed deserving of such signs. For before the setting of the sun, chariots and armed troops were seen throughout the whole region, in mid-air, wheeling through the clouds and encircling the cities. It says that neither could this portentous spectacle be occasioned by the aurora borealis, for it occurred before the setting of the sun or merely the fancy of a few villagers gazing at the heavens, for it was seen in various parts of the country. Another sign is at the feast, which is called Pentecost, when the priests entered the temple at night, as was their custom, to perform their services. They said that at first they perceived a movement and a noise, and afterward a voice as of a great multitude, saying, Let us go hence. And accordingly, before the period for celebrating this feast return, the Jewish war had commenced. And in the space of three years afterwards, Jerusalem was surrounded by the Roman army, the temple converted into a citadel, and its sacred courts were streaming with the blood of human victims. But what follows is more terrible. For a certain Jesus, the son of Ananias, a common countryman, four years before the war, when the city was particularly prosperous and peaceful, came to the feast, at which it was customary for all to make tents at the temple to the honor of God and suddenly began to cry out, A voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four winds, a voice against Jerusalem and the temple, a voice against bridegrooms and brides, a voice against all people. Day and night he went through all the alleys, crying thus. But certain of the more distinguished citizens, vexed at the ominous cry, seized the man and beat him with many stripes. But without uttering a word in his own behalf, or saying anything in particular to those that were present, he continued to cry in the same words as before. And the rulers, thinking, as was true, that the man was moved by a higher power, brought him before the Roman governor. And then, though he was scourged to the bone, he neither made supplication nor shed tears. But changing his voice to the most lamentable tone possible, he answered each stroke with the words, Woe, woe unto Jerusalem. Jesus, the son of Ananias, continued this cry for seven years and five months, even through the war, until one day, when he was making his rounds on the wall, he shouted with a piercing voice, 
Woe once more to the city, to the people, and to the temple. Then he suddenly added, And woe to me also, and was immediately struck by a stone that was launched from a ballista, and he died. Messiah rebuked the Jewish leaders and cast many woe judgments against them. And now Jesus, the son of Ananias, was declaring woe judgments against the Jews, pointing to the calming desolation of Jerusalem, the temple, and the Jewish nation. What an amazing account from Eusebius about the signs which occurred before the siege of Jerusalem. That's all for today. Love y'all. Shalom.